Why do these stories about unfaithful wives always seem like cliches? It's the same hackneyed plot. I unexpectedly returned home, came across an incriminating email, saw her with her lover at a holiday meeting in the office, or accidentally noticed her car parked outside a motel room. There must be alternative scenarios where a devoted husband discovers his wife's infidelity. It can be assumed that there are other options, but perhaps this is not the case. Perhaps there are only a few ways in which a man realizes that his marriage has suddenly collapsed and burned down. Personally, it took me a sudden and unexpected realization to understand the true nature of my wife's relationship with her lover over the past six months. I was completely unaware of all this. Shannon and I crossed paths in our sophomore year of college, and we were immediately attracted to each other. Her beautiful brown hair, captivating blue eyes, attractive face and slender figure with long legs made her flawless. She was perfect to me. But what really captured my heart is her wonderful personality. Shannon was not only smart, but also lively, and it was nice to be with her. Our conversations could last for hours, covering a wide range of topics. We became best friends, and after three months of living together, we shared our first intimate moment in the backseat of my car, discreetly parked behind a local sports complex. It was an important milestone in my life, despite my clumsiness and indecision. When our bodies joined, she shed tears of happiness, not pain, as she assured me. Her words will always remain in my memory. Stu, we did it after all, she exclaimed. At that moment, all doubts disappeared, and it became clear that Shannon and I were destined to be together forever, or, as we thought for the next 10 years at least. My name is Stuart Gray. I come from a modest town in the Midwest, where I was born and raised. At six feet tall and weighing 187 pounds, I am quite attractive with my sandy hair and captivating brown eyes. As a contractor by profession, I run my own small company, which employs a dedicated team of five people. We specialize in interior renovation and serve those who can afford it. The quality of our work is highly appreciated in the industry. On the other hand, Shannon, my beloved wife, teaches music at the local high school. Together, we have built a comfortable life, living in a beautiful house. We are now in our 30s, and we look forward to having a family in the near future. Reflecting on the past decade, I have to admit that our marriage was just a happy one. Our intimate life was fulfilling, although I won't exaggerate when I say that we make love twice a day. Instead, we find satisfaction three times a week, which is more than enough for us. But our last vacation was completely different. We decided to go on a spontaneous trip in the middle of July, when the heat reached its peak. It was a chance to escape from the hustle and bustle and spend time together. Every evening during the vacation, we snuggled up to each other, as we always did. It was a cozy routine that brought us even closer together. And every morning when I opened my eyes and saw Shannon lying next to me, I couldn't help but admire her beauty. I realized how lucky I was to be able to call her my wife. If it meant sacrificing my own life for hers, I wouldn't hesitate for a second. These thoughts occupied me as we set off on this unforgettable journey, but I didn't know that our perfect vacation would take an unexpected turn. A shocking event that came from nowhere blinded me leaving me emotionally shattered. I still can't fully recover from its effects. As a contractor working in the Midwest, I understood that our work was mostly seasonal. Spring, summer, and autumn were the busiest months, and winter was the time of hibernation. Most people prefer to avoid home repairs during low temperatures and heavy snowfall. That's why Shannon and I usually planned our vacations for Christmas and New Year holidays, or during spring break. But this time we decided to break the established pattern and escape into the scorching July heat. It was a spontaneous decision, a chance to break out of the routine and create unforgettable memories together. During the summer, while I was busy working and making money, Shannon took time off from time to time to visit family, go shopping with her sisters, or attend summer courses to support her teaching skills. Every winter, our favorite tradition was to escape to warmer climes, 
and in the winter of our downfall, we chose a luxury all-inclusive resort in the Bahamas. It was supposed to be two weeks of paradise, a chance for us to reconnect body and spirit. But I didn't know yet how much I was wrong. Before Shannon and I boarded the plane in Minneapolis, I want to emphasize that I was completely oblivious to the problems in our marriage. If someone claimed otherwise, I would vehemently deny it, and perhaps even angrily oppose them. We were the epitome of an ideal couple, deeply in love with each other and easily connecting on all levels. It seemed that we were two personalities who merged into one inseparable whole. Our union was so unbreakable that I believed that nothing could ever come between us, not even the forces of heaven and earth. Unfortunately, I did not remember that Hill also exists. And at that moment I was blissfully unaware of its presence. I stood shakily on the edge, ready to plunge into the scorching depths. The first realization that everything was wrong came to me at the security checkpoint at the Minneapolis, St. Paul International Airport. The queue stretched endlessly while many people tried to take shelter from the bitter cold in tropical harbors. As I waited patiently for my turn to go through the scanners, I couldn't help but notice the gentleman in the next line stealing glances at Shannon. Of course, this was not a rare occurrence. My wife has a captivating attractiveness, often attracting the attention and coveted glances of men. But there was something different about this situation. It seemed like he was deliberately trying to get her attention. Intrigued, I glanced at him imperceptibly, pretending to study my boarding pass. His glances in her direction were secretive and secretive, but then I saw something that confirmed my suspicions. Shannon quickly looked back at him and made a barely noticeable gesture with her hand, as if signaling him to wait. He replied with a smile and a nod, which made my stomach rumble uncomfortably. It was obvious that they knew each other, although the extent of their relationship remained unknown to me. This realization made me uneasy. While we were going through the control, I kept a close eye on both of them, but neither side tried to make contact anymore. I fell silent. My mind was full of thoughts, but Shannon didn't seem to notice my concern. Perhaps her mind was on other things. I prayed that this man, whoever he was, would not be a passenger on our flight. But my hopes were dashed when we boarded and took our seats. To my horror, he was occupying an aisle seat about 15 rows in front of us. It seemed unusual to me when Shannon chose an aisle seat in our row. Usually she always wants a window seat, but this time it was different. I asked her about it because I had specifically reserved a window seat for her, sacrificing my own comfort in the middle seat. Shannon just said that she didn't like breakfast and didn't want to inconvenience anyone if she needed to use the bathroom. To please her, I went up to the woman sitting by the aisle and kindly asked if she would mind moving to the window seat. Explaining that my wife had stomach problems, she readily agreed, and we successfully switched places. Despite the fact that I usually have no problems falling asleep on airplanes, my heightened state of anxiety prevented me from doing so during the long flight from Minneapolis to Miami. Still, I decided to pretend to be asleep while traveling. After putting our hand-me-downs in the top basket, Shannon put her purse under the seat in front of her. When the plane took off, I discreetly put on my twin's baseball cap and pulled it over my forehead, pretending to be fast asleep. Having positioned myself so as not to take my eyes off Shannon, I noticed how she looked at me after about 15 minutes. Confident that I was asleep, she took the opportunity to get up and head towards the toilets. Sensing that something suspicious was going on between her and a friend sitting next to her, I shifted in my seat to get a full view of the aisle. Passing by the place of an acquaintance, she imperceptibly caught up with him, lightly touching his shoulder, which served as another proof that there really is a connection between them and that this whole situation is not a simple coincidence. I couldn't help but notice that they avoided looking into each other's eyes. Shannon excused herself and went to the bathroom. When she returned, she met his gaze, which prompted him to get up and walk over to her. Instead of stepping aside to let the other pass, they met in the aisle and froze for a moment. He gently placed his hand on her waist, and she lightly touched his chest before talking to him. 
A warm smile appeared on both their faces. As Shannon headed back to her seat, his hand slowly slid down her back, making her smile again. One glance was enough for me to understand that there is a deep connection between these two people, and, most likely, they are on some intimate level. At the same time, a wave of horror swept over me as it became painfully clear that my once happy marriage was now under threat and could end. Overwhelmed with anguish, I turned away from Shannon as she settled into her seat and fastened her seatbelt. How could she betray me like that? How long did this affair last? Who is this person, and how far has their relationship gone? All these thoughts occupied me throughout the flight. Trying to make sense of everything I saw, I desperately hoped that he would not be on our flight to Nassau. But deep down, I intuitively felt that he would be there. Unfortunately, my intuition was confirmed as soon as Shannon and I boarded the plane. He was sitting a few rows behind us, engrossed in the logbook, oblivious to our presence. Shannon, who seemed to have recovered from her stomach problems, took her usual place by the window. The flight itself was uneventful, and after landing we picked up our luggage and arranged for a car to take us to the resort. While I was driving, Shannon was busily pressing the button on her phone, texting her mom and sisters to inform them of our safe arrival. Although I tried to convince myself that all this was harmless, one unpleasant thought crept into my head. I really wanted to test her words on myself. Isn't it strange how suspicions escalate and become all-consuming? Our room at the resort was amazing, with a balcony overlooking the ocean and a picturesque pool. When we unpacked, I realized that I had to take a bold step to get my wife back. Stealing myself, I walked over to Shannon, took her in my arms and kissed her gently on the neck. Can you realize the depth of my love for you? Shannon turned her body to mine and kissed me gently on the lips. I love you too, baby, she whispered. But there was an unusual gleam in her eyes and I felt uneasy, as if she had distanced herself from us, disconnected from the world around her. It sent goosebumps down my spine. I leaned in for another kiss, desperately trying to calm myself down. You know I would never hurt you, Shannon, I begged. She shuddered slightly. I know that, Stu, she replied, her voice trembling. I know that you will never hurt me or our beautiful marriage. She continued to shudder, and there were tears in her eyes. Of course, Stu. Although she couldn't meet my gaze, Shannon's words echoed in the room. It dawned on me. I probably lost the battle. If she hadn't done it yet, I knew she would soon give herself to another man. I loosened my grip and hurried to the bathroom, praying that I wouldn't lose control of myself before I got to her. I spent several minutes inside trying to regain my composure and constantly asking myself questions. How did it happen? What did I do to get her into the arms of another? Why didn't I notice this before, a few weeks or even months ago? But most importantly, how can I stop her from doing irreparable damage to us? Or is it too late? I splashed water on my face and left the bathroom. Shannon was waiting for me with a strange expression on her face. Oh no, Stu, I just started my period, and I forgot to bring tampons with me. What? I exclaimed. Are you on your period, Shannon? They ended just a week ago. How is it possible for them to start so soon? I'm not sure. It happens from time to time. Perhaps the excitement caused by the vacation provoked him. I need to run into the gift shop and buy tampons. And she left, closing the door behind her. At first I thought it might be a good thing. Perhaps this will slow down the romantic relationship between her and her mysterious boyfriend. But I quickly realized that nothing was adding up. In all the years of our life together, this has never happened. She always took birth control pills, and her menstruation was regular. So why would she make it up? If only... Unless she believed that menstruation would turn me away from the desire to make love, allowing her to focus all her love and passion on a new partner. If that's the case, then she wasn't the woman I married. No one can be so cunning and heartless. She must really despise me to organize this trip, plan and finance it, and then pull away from me and give everything she has to a man I've never even met. I felt completely discouraged, as if I was losing my mind. 
Who was this woman whom I adored with every fiber of my being for more than ten years? When I looked around the room, I was overcome by a feeling of emptiness. Glancing at the TV, I noticed that she had casually left her mobile phone next to it. Curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to turn it on, not knowing if she had changed the access code. To my surprise, she didn't, which was another oversight on her part. Scrolling through her messages, I came across the most recent from a certain Anthony Eisner. Intrigued, I decided to return to the beginning of their conversation, which began during our trip to the resort. Hi baby, you look amazing. I can't wait to see you. You little hooligan, you almost got us caught by Stu at the airport. I couldn't help myself, Shen. Stu was fast asleep so you could have done it. But it might raise eyebrows. To look into the future? I have to go, we're almost there. Their conversation resumed when we checked into our room at the resort. I'm in the lobby. Are you here already? I'm in my room. Stu's in the bathroom. He's acting weird. Who cares about Stu? When will you be free so that I can completely possess you? From the very beginning of our relationship, Tony, I have repeatedly made it clear that I cannot and do not want to fulfill your request. Stu, my husband, is an exceptional partner who loves and cares for me, providing a life beyond anything you could offer. Anthony, while I admit that our physical intimacy gives me more pleasure than Stu, I have to admit that no one satisfies me like you do. You understand how to please me, and you take me on exciting adventures that Stu could never have dreamed of. But no matter how incredible your passionate love is, I need something more, and that's what Stu provides. Stu and I are looking forward to starting our journey to start a family, which means that the next two weeks will be dedicated only to you, my love. I informed Stu that I would stop taking birth control pills as soon as we got home, but the truth is, I stopped taking them almost three weeks ago. This gives us the opportunity to conceive a child within the next two weeks, creating a child that Stu will lovingly raise as his own. Your words are very provocative, Shung, and I have to admit that I like it. I can't wait to create a baby in your warm embrace. My God, I'm trembling with impatience. I can't wait to be with you. Have you thought about Stu Boy? How can you be sure that he won't get ahead of me in the next two weeks? Because he's not interested in a physical relationship with me, stupid. I plan to tell him that I've just started my period again and, coincidentally, it's going to last our entire vacation. Honey, are you sure he'll believe you? Absolutely. He loves me and knows that I would never lie to him. Besides, when we get home, I'll make it up to him. Wow, he's really naive. What a loser. Please stop calling him that, otherwise you will lose. You're going to lose me forever. We both know that you won't let this happen. You need my love too much. That's true, but I still don't like it when you speak ill of Stu. He's a good guy. Okay, let's meet in the lobby. I want to kiss you passionately. You have exclusive rights to my lips for the next two weeks. Give me five minutes. I stood there completely stunned, and a wave of shock swept over me. At first I had the intention to replace her phone, but then I hesitated. Perhaps, I thought, these messages could serve as valuable evidence in our impending divorce. After thinking about it, I started changing her phone to my own, and only then realized that a lot of personal information was stored in my own device. It was her actions that created this chaotic situation, so I decided to keep both phones with me, leaving her to find her own way out of this mess. No doubt she wouldn't have noticed the phone was missing right away, but by then, I would have been far away. The taste of bile rose in my throat, threatening to suffocate me, and I could not shake off a deep sense of betrayal. In search of solace, I went to the window and looked out at the breathtaking Caribbean landscape. Just eight hours ago, I was overwhelmed with happiness, anticipating two weeks of blissful romance under the tropical sun with the woman I considered the love of my life, my wife, my soulmate. Now my world has collapsed, leaving me all alone, shocked and overcome with anger. At that moment I was seized with the desire to hurt them both, 
to destroy them for the immeasurable humiliation they had subjected me to. But gradually common sense took over. Divorce was inevitable. I couldn't stand the thought of staying with my cheating wife any longer. The pain and betrayal consumed me, but I knew I wanted more than just to leave. As I was looking out the window, my gaze accidentally fell on the pool below, where they were entwined in a passionate embrace. Anthony's hands caressed Shannon's back as she clung to him, increasing the disgust that was bubbling up inside me. Suppressing the urge to vomit, I took a deep breath and reached for my cell phone. Filming their actions on video, I realized that Shannon never bothered to look out the window of our room. If she had, she would have seen the pool in plain sight. At that moment, I realized that I needed a plan, and as soon as possible. But emotions overwhelmed me, and my mind was paralyzed. And then, a simple but brilliant idea came to my mind. Shannon wanted to spend two weeks with her lover Anthony to conceive a child, and I needed time to start the process of ending our marriage. I decided to give her these two weeks, taking advantage of the opportunity to share our lives. After unpacking just a few items of clothing, I packed my things with ease, which allowed me to quickly prepare for a way out of this toxic situation. I looked out the window to make sure that the lovers were not moving away from each other. They were sitting close, hugging, talking and laughing, probably discussing an upcoming date on the island. I thought about making their lives easier. They could occupy any of their rooms and spend as much time together as they wanted. I decided to leave. As I headed for the door, a thought occurred to me that brought a smile to my face. Instead of acting, I thought it best to collect her underwear, nightgowns and dresses from drawers and cupboards, piling them on the floor. After that, I opened her suitcase and took out the KY gel that she had packed. He carefully poured it on the pile and then began to work on all her perfumes, shampoos and cosmetics. I quickly poured their contents onto the sticky pile just to make myself known. I knew she would clean everything up, but that would keep her from wearing provocative outfits for her lover for at least a day or two. Although I understood that ultimately their desire was to be naked together, and then her disheveled clothes would not matter at all. Still, it gave me some comfort. I hastily buttoned my trousers and left the room, not bothering to close the door behind me. When I reached the reception desk, I informed the employee about the unforeseen circumstances that forced me to return home. She regretfully informed me that the money for the two-week reservation would not be refunded, to which I only nodded in agreement. Sacrificing the prepaid money was a small price to pay for getting rid of the presence of his wife and her lover. Moreover, I planned to deduct this amount from her share of the divorce proceedings, since she was undoubtedly to blame for the fact that our vacation turned into a disaster. After returning the rented car to the airport, I only hoped that I would be able to catch a flight in any direction. Fortunately, a plane was scheduled to leave for Orlando in two hours, which made it possible to transfer to Minneapolis with a transfer in just 90 minutes. After checking my luggage and going through security, I managed to find a secluded place in the corner of the bar. Feeling the need for a strong drink, I ordered a double scotch. It had been a little over an hour since I left the resort and I knew that Shannon and her lover most likely already knew about my absence. Still, I was somewhat taken aback when Shannon's phone, which now belonged to me, rang. Glancing at the screen, I noticed that the call came from an unknown number. Deciding to ignore it, I let the call go to voicemail. A few moments later, I heard Shannon's voice fill the airwaves, her tone on the verge of hysteria. Stu? What the hell is going on? Are you crazy? Why did you ruin all my precious clothes? Please call me, baby. I'm all worked up with worry. No, Shannon, I thought to myself. You're only worried about yourself and a ruined vacation spent in intimate pleasures. After turning off my voicemail, I was faced with another call just five minutes later. Stu, you're just scaring me. Where are you, my love? I have no idea what you think I did, but you're wrong. I would never hurt you, Stuart. My love for you is boundless. Please, God, call me. 
Unfortunately, I accidentally deleted the previous message. After making three more desperate calls, I decided to send her a message. Shannon, you made a mistake and left text messages on your phone. Enjoy the next two weeks with Anthony, starting a family. But upon your return, you will be handed the divorce papers and Anthony will be sued for causing mental suffering. If I find out that he's working with you, I will also file a lawsuit against the school district and fight to have both of you fired on the grounds of immorality. Now you have each other, and Tony Boy can have you endlessly, take you to all those places that I could never afford. I had no idea that our intimate life had disappointed you so much. Ten minutes later I received a text message from Shannon. Oh God, please don't do this. I've never been unhappy with our lovemaking, not once. Stuart, you mean the world to me. This whole situation was a stupid mistake. I would never do that. I'm really sorry. Two minutes later, another voice message came, and I heard her sobbing uncontrollably. Please, my love, I'm begging you. My heart belongs only to you, not Tony. I can't live without you. But after learning about your betrayal and how you are connected to Anthony, I realize that my love for you is now tainted. It is impossible to truly love a person and cause them the pain that you caused me. I don't want to be a part of your deceptive world anymore. You and Tony, both liars, are meant for each other. Goodbye, Shannon. I have no desire to see or talk to you ever again. After sending the message, I turned off my phone and drove into the garage, noticing that the atmosphere in the house had changed. He became colder and lonelier, devoid of any happiness. It had once been a house, but now it looked like an empty shell with simple furniture. During the flight on the plane, I made a list of tasks that I needed to solve, including putting the house up for sale with the help of a real estate agent. Despite the downturn in the housing market, at least I will be relieved of the burden of mortgage payments. Shannon and I flew to the Bahamas on Saturday, and now, on Sunday evening, so much has happened in just 36 hours. I will start the divorce proceedings tomorrow. Right now, I was completely exhausted and in desperate need of rest. When I woke up on Monday morning, the sun was shining, but my head was splitting and there was an unpleasant taste in my mouth. I went into the kitchen, made a cup of coffee and turned on my mobile phone. To my surprise, there were over 20 messages, all pleading for forgiveness. When she found out about my departure, she immediately contacted Tony and firmly stated that she never wanted to see him again. She strongly denied that there was any intimate relationship between them, considering it all just a joke. It became obvious that she took pleasure in teasing him and then returned to me for intimacy. The audacity of her actions caused me not only a deep dislike for her, but also a feeling of unease for her. To top it all off, the last message on my phone was from Anthony himself. He brazenly stated that I could take any action against my wife, claiming that she was a despicable person, and he was glad that he was free of her. But at the same time, he warned that any attempt at revenge would lead to eternal repentance. In response, I firmly told him that he would be in my power as long as I carried out my intentions. I called him the embodiment of a lower form of life, devoid of even the slightest signs of masculinity. His inability to have a partner of his own led him to prey on married women. I sincerely hope that he does not lose his vigilance, because he will have to constantly look over his shoulder for the rest of his miserable existence. And I also have to inform you that his career is virtually over. Soon he will be mourning his very existence. By 10.30 a.m., I had already set up an appointment with a divorce lawyer for the next day. Before noon, I dealt with smaller tasks such as canceling credit cards and allocating funds to checking and savings accounts. I decided to solve issues such as life insurance, medical insurance, and car insurance later. Fortunately, there was no need to change the door locks, as they were all from Baldwin Prestige. All I had to do was reconfigure them to work with a different key which was not difficult at all. Even though I was ready for Shannon's return, I doubted she would return to the house. It is possible that she will stay with Tony, especially considering that their plans to start a family seem to have been influenced by my departure. 
If I were in her place, I would take advantage of the remaining two weeks at the resort, especially since everything has already been paid for. She could come home with a nice tan, regardless of whether she was carrying Tony's baby or not. I couldn't sleep all Monday night, and on Tuesday morning I made the necessary calls to the insurance companies to discharge Shannon from all policies. It was comforting that she had her own health and life insurance through the school district. I took on the difficult task of collecting all of Shannon's clothes and personal belongings and putting them in the garage. Although I knew that I had overlooked some things, I assured myself that she would have the opportunity to pick them up later. Later that day, I visited my newly hired lawyer to tell him everything that had happened, presenting him with text messages and videos that I had filmed. He was sympathetic to the fact that Shannon had caused me suffering, but informed me that the court would not be inclined in my favor due to the lack of children and adultery. It seemed that a fair 50-50 division of property was the likely outcome. But I will still be able to keep all the property that was given to me by my parents before our marriage. In fact, I was at a disadvantage. But I was determined to go through whatever it took to get rid of Shannon. That evening, as I was relaxing under a generous helping of single malt whiskey, the landline phone rang. Assuming it was Shannon, I decided to meet her face to face and express my contempt, so I reluctantly answered the phone. To my surprise, it was Shannon's sister, Deborah, who lived in St. Paul, a 30-minute drive away. Stu, what have you done? What do you mean, Deborah? I was struck by the feeling of serenity that I experienced. At the moment, your wife is in my guest room and she is completely upset. She can't seem to stop crying. It looks like she's getting ready to live on the streets. And all she can articulate is that you're divorcing her. Deborah, I'm not going to go into details. If Shannon wants to talk about what happened during our vacation, it has to come directly from her. But suffice it to say that something happened that caused irreparable damage to our marriage. Therefore, I had no choice but to return home ahead of time, alone, and start the divorce process. Stu, you've got to be kidding. Shannon loves you with every fiber of her being. She lives for you. You must have misunderstood something, Stu. I didn't understand anything, Deborah, And I have video evidence of her actions to back up my claims. Inform Shannon that most of her clothes and personal belongings are already packed in the garage, she can take everything when she sees fit. I just can't understand what you're saying, Stu. She talks about you all the time. About you and the baby you two were planning to have. Well, her plans for the baby changed dramatically when we arrived in the Bahamas. But she was going to have a baby anyway. I'm sorry, Deborah, but I've talked to you enough. Any additional information should come from Shannon. Is she planning to stay with you for a while? Yes, it looks like it. I have enough space for her. I just hope that the two of you can overcome this and move on together. That's not going to happen anymore, Deborah. Shannon and I don't have a life together anymore and we never will. She made the decision to get rid of us in the most humiliating way. Is it okay if I deliver the divorce papers to her at your house? Oh, Stu, can't you wait? For her sake? She didn't take my feelings into account, so I returned the favor. When will the documents be handed over? In a couple of days, I will inform you in advance. I'm really sorry, Stu, for both of you. I thought you had a perfect marriage. I thought so too, but that's not what Shannon wanted. I ended the conversation and went back to my scotch. Three days later, Shannon received the documents at her sister's house. She didn't even hire a lawyer and agreed to a settlement agreement. She expressed her willingness to sign the divorce papers, but on the condition that she would have one personal meeting with me, at which she would tell me everything. Although I had no desire to hear her version of events, I agreed to this condition because it seemed to me the fastest way to complete our divorce. We agreed to meet in a separate conference room in my lawyer's office, setting up a meeting for Wednesday afternoon, three weeks later. I arrived early, and when Shannon entered the room, I was overwhelmed with emotions. She looked frail and broken, and she avoided looking me in the eye. It was obvious that the whole ordeal had unsettled her, even though it was because of her actions. 
It devastated me as much, if not more, than it did her. Sitting opposite each other, each of us kept a box of face wipes and a bottle of water handy, knowing that they would be needed during our conversation. I plucked up the courage to break the silence. How are you, Shannon? I asked, trying my best to look sympathetic. She shrugged, her face filled with sadness. Oh, not really, Stu, not really at all, she replied, her voice trembling. Unfortunately, I can say that I'm sorry. I nodded understandingly, agreeing with her feelings. I know, I said softly. Shannon reached for a napkin, wiped her nose and snorted, avoiding my eyes. Her vulnerability was obvious, and it broke my heart. What did you want to talk about? I asked. Taking a deep breath, she gathered her thoughts. I wanted to explain everything, but I don't know how, she admitted. Why don't you start from the beginning? She sighed, pulled herself together and began her story. Okay, Stu, I'll try, she said, her voice shaking. Anthony and I met last summer when we both attended classes at the State University. We had coffee a couple of times and had dinner once. We struck up a friendship. We talked and flirted a lot. But that was the end of it. I've always made it clear that I'm happily married. When she spoke, the weight of her words hung in the air, and I realized that this was just the beginning of a long and painful conversation. I was shocked when I found out that he had been transferred to my school as the new deputy principal. After several lunch meetings, he invited me to have a drink with him to relax after a protracted parent-teacher meeting. Despite the fact that I understood that this was not the wisest decision, I liked his company, and I agreed. Did anything happen between you that night? Well, to some extent. We had a few drinks, and at one point Tony took my hand and expressed his sympathy for me. How did you react? I admitted that I feel the same way about him. Subsequently, he expressed a desire to get to know me better to spend more time with me, to be alone, just the two of us, in a private setting. And how did you react to that? I told him that I was deeply devoted to my husband and could not do anything that could jeopardize our marriage. What was his reaction? He assured me that we would act carefully and prudently, ensuring that you would never find out about it. He claimed that it would boost my self-confidence if I witnessed another man's intense desire, promising that he would never take me out of my comfort zone. His intention was just to give me the opportunity to experience the feeling that someone else besides my husband loves me. Did he specify exactly what he meant for the two of you? She shook her head, indicating that he hadn't given any details. But from the way he held my hand, from the look in his eyes and from his words, it was quite obvious that he wanted me intimately. Did he ask for more from you? I demanded more information from her. She looked up at me again with tears in her eyes and confessed that he wanted to have an intimate relationship with her. How did you react to that? Instead of anger, it caused me excitement and fear. Tony is an attractive man, but no more so than you. But it was strange for me to realize that I was liked by another attractive man besides my husband. Did his words make you want him? She flinched for a moment, but eventually nodded. Yes, it is. Did you end up going home with him? Not that night. I told him that I needed time to think about such an important decision. He understood and assured me that he would wait patiently for as long as it took. He walked me to the car, and when I was about to get in, he suddenly turned me around and kissed me. At the same moment, I reciprocated the kiss. Then he gently led me into the car, joined me, and we continued to exchange passionate kisses. Is that all that happened? She shook her head and shrugged her shoulders. We were just kissing. So you've been doing everything except intercourse? She confirmed it with a nod. Yes, everything except that. How long did it take until he finally slept with you? The next day, it happened during a teacher planning day when he walked into my classroom and expressed gratitude for the previous night. I felt embarrassed and guilty for our actions, but he assured me that we had not truly betrayed you. 
he admitted that thoughts about me occupy all his thoughts, and expressed such a desire for me, which he did not feel for any other woman. He promised that if I gave myself to him just once, he would never ask for anything more, and assured me that you would never find out about it. I was fascinated, unable to resist his words. I decided to go with him, but with the understanding that it would be a one-time thing. I can't explain why, Stu. I just wanted to experience the happiness of being with another man, even though we were always perfect together. But I didn't have a starting point because I had never been with anyone else. I know how empty and selfish this sounds, but I want to be honest with you. What happened next? We arrived at Tony's house and immediately went to his bedroom. He treated me with such tenderness and romance, Stu. He wanted me so much that I was sure I wanted him to make love to me. Did you ever think of me at that moment? At that moment, no. It came later. At that moment, I was consumed by passion. Shannon looked at me, wiping her tears with a napkin. I realize how much pain I have caused you. I stand, and I understand that my words only exacerbate this pain. It is impossible to convey the depth of my regret and how stupid I feel. It may sound cliched, but my love for you surpasses everything else in my life, and I would willingly sacrifice myself if it could ease your suffering. But after listening to her, I realized that her sincerity came too late. I will never be able to come to terms with her. This affair with Tony became a regular one, as I couldn't tear myself away from him. I can hardly find the words to describe it. Tony wasn't the kind of person I particularly liked in many ways. He had qualities like arrogance, self-centeredness, and some arrogance that I didn't like. But when he was with me, it was unlike anything I had experienced before. It was as if I was becoming dependent on his presence. Surprisingly, we were able to hide our relationship. We were careful, especially at first. Some of our colleagues at work began to suspect something due to the fact that we exchanged glances, often touched each other, spent too much time together and went on a lunch break together. But the most interesting thing is that my love for you has not weakened for a second. It seemed that my life consisted of two separate and unrelated parts. As for our intimate meetings, we engaged in intimacy about two to three times a week. That was the frequency with which they occurred. Now I want to know exactly when you and Tony agreed that I would pay for your vacation and you would have fun with him all the time. I suggested to him that I would cover the costs of our romantic trip to the island, but he refused this decision. It was about a week before we left when Tony, who had not originally intended to join, suddenly changed his mind at the last minute. He said he couldn't bear to be apart from me for two weeks. After hearing this, I completely lost control of my emotions. I couldn't stop thinking about him being by my side for two whole weeks. What about me? How are you going to fit me into your plans? To make sure that you don't want intimacy with me, I resorted to telling you that I started my period. I knew that during your golf and deep sea fishing classes, I would have plenty of opportunities for intimacy with Tony. Did you really believe that I would be stupid enough to believe your excuses about menstruation? I always believed that you loved me so deeply that you would believe anything I said. And that's when you decided to let Tony impregnate you? Even before I knew Tony was going to be present, I had already made the decision to stop taking birth control pills. I had the romantic idea of getting pregnant with you during our vacation. I thought it would be an incredible experience. But everything changed when Tony decided to join us. I saw this as an opportunity for him to give me a baby as a parting gift. I made it clear to him that our stay together in the Bahamas would be our last. Although the passion between us was still strong, the novelty began to fade, and my desire to spend the rest of my life with you grew. Unfortunately, we both acted recklessly and thoughtlessly, and everything went wrong. She admitted the truth when she realized that everything had really collapsed. When I discovered that all my underwear and seductive dresses had been destroyed and noticed your absence, my whole world collapsed before my eyes. The devastation I felt was overwhelming. In search of solace, 
I turned to Tony telling him about the unfortunate incident. To my surprise, he unceremoniously remarked that now we would have two weeks to conceive a child. Filled with anger, I immediately kicked him out of the room, saying that I never wanted to catch his eye again. Did you have an intimate relationship with him before you returned to Minneapolis? Shannon's complexion visibly drained. Tears flowed down her cheeks as she quietly whispered her answer. Yes. The night before I left the resort, I came up with an idea. Whose idea was that? Him. But I decided to agree. He called it our farewell meeting, but it lasted all night. I do not know the exact number of times, but the next morning I could barely walk. Therefore, there is a possibility that your wish has come true and you are carrying Tony's baby. She visibly flinched but acknowledged the possibility. I guess I'll find out the truth soon. If I'm really pregnant, what do you think I should do? Ask Tony for support, Shannon replied with a shrug and a calm tone. To be honest, I'm standing. I'm not sure. I guess I'll deal with it myself if that situation arises. I guess I'm already fed up with this conversation. I stood up, expressing my gratitude for the shame she had given me. Tears streamed down her face and she buried her face in her hands. Oh my God, Stu, I'm so sorry. I never meant to hurt you. I just made a stupid mistake, and now I've paid the highest price for it. All is not lost, Shannon. Remember, you still retain your dignity, knowing that two men would give anything to be in your presence. I, on the other hand, have lost my marriage and self-respect. Imagine that you've lost your whole world and experienced a crushing wave of humiliation, then maybe you'll understand what it's like. Shannon pleaded, Sue, do you think we have a chance to overcome this? I couldn't help but laugh, which prompted me to ask Shannon what she thought about it. She tried to smile, but eventually shook her head in disagreement. It's been almost two years since the divorce, and Shannon got pregnant while meeting Tony in the Bahamas. Some may think I'm a heartless person for filing a lawsuit against the school district where Shannon and Anthony worked. But I don't care what they think. Anthony, who held a position of authority over my wife, was the one who seduced her. Although I did not receive any financial compensation for the claim, it did not matter much to me. Having lost their jobs, both lovebirds were looking for a new job. Shannon endured our breakup hard and eventually went into premature labor, as a result of which she died during childbirth, and the baby was saved. As for me, I've had the opportunity to date different women over the past year, but now I've met a sweet and kind woman who has a three-year-old daughter. We have been together for several months now and even discussed the possibility of moving in together to raise our children together. Yes, I have a daughter, Shannon's daughter, whom I took from the orphanage. I adopted a tiny girl and I want to raise her as a decent person, not like her mother was. I'm going to carry out a plan that will expose and shame my wife Charlene and her illegitimate partner. She needs to understand that I will not tolerate infidelity. As we neared our house, I prepared to put my plan into action. It was obvious that Charlene and Howard were going to have a difficult day. Never underestimate the consequences of stepping over someone like me, Bubba. Let me tell you how we got into this unpleasant situation. My name is Bubba Clarence Jones, but everyone knows me as Bubba, and it's very important that they address me accordingly. No one dares to call me Clarence. To be honest, we can say that our story is widely known. Charlene, my beloved wife and I have been happily married for two decades. We are 42 years old, and our journey began when we were only 12 years old. From that moment on, we never sought communication outside of each other's arms. As the sweethearts of the lower grades and then the seniors, our bond was unprecedented. I, the esteemed captain of the football team, and Charlene, the charismatic senior cheerleader, were admired as the epitome of the perfect couple. As soon as we graduated from high school, we sealed our love with the bonds of marriage. Our modest home is located in a medium-sized town located in the heart of oil-rich Texas. To provide for us, I got a job at a well-known drilling company as a diligent driller. 
Charlene became a full-time mother, devoting her time to taking care of our children. Soon after that, several more children appeared in our lives. Charlene has an extraordinary beauty that has no equal. She is about 5 feet 10 inches tall, and her long legs are just an amazing sight. I especially like the way she hugs me, wrapping her graceful limbs around my waist. Our intimate relationship began during our school years, and although we were inexperienced at first, we quickly discovered various ways to please each other. Over the next three years, we had two children, but the birth of the second child turned out to be difficult for Charlene. After careful consideration, we decided to put an end to our intimate relationship. To allay all concerns, I had a vasectomy so that contraception would not cause concern. I don't want to brag, but I must admit that I am very skilled in the field of intimate pleasure. I saw the delight in Charlene's eyes, making her scream in a fit of passion. Of course, the same can be said about its effect on me. Even after so many years of living together, we still have that undeniable bond, so it's hard for me to understand why she betrayed me. As soon as our children started high school, Charlene expressed a desire to make a career. She enrolled in junior college to become a law assistant. Subsequently, she got a job at a local law firm that specialized in leasing oil and gas fields, as well as other related issues. A few years earlier, I started doing business by opening my own business related to the preparation of sites for oil wells. Given the limited competition in Texas, my business was booming fast. As a result, I began to earn a significant income, which allowed us to move out of the trailer and build a beautiful house in a prestigious area. Our financial situation is thriving, and Charlene gets great satisfaction from her profession. To run my business, I have to travel frequently, as my company operates in different states, including Texas, New Mexico, and part of Louisiana. Despite my trips, I assured myself that everything was going well. While I was away, I never worried about Charlene. She has always adored and admired me, but it seems that she had a certain desire that needed to be fulfilled. About four months ago, Charlene's law firm hired a young man named Howard Bishop, who graduated from law school. He was attractive, he was about 30, but he was married and had two small children. Charlene never stopped praising his intelligence and excellent qualities. I happened to meet him at the firm's Christmas party last month. It was noticeable that he had a sense of superiority and treated me as if I were some kinds of crude oil man or something like that. In truth, I could easily surpass his financial situation. Throughout the night, Charlene drank and spent a lot of time with him. They even danced together several times. It was obvious that his wife was also not happy with what was happening, but I convinced myself that Charlene was just drunk and decided to leave it as it is. Moreover, when we returned home, Charlene was incredibly passionate with me. It was hard for me to keep up with her intense desire, but I managed. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't resist asking if she had feelings for the young lawyer. She burst out laughing, dismissing my question as madness. According to her, I was the only man who ignited such a passion in her. She assured me that I was the only person she needed and wanted to see in her life. She believed in my loyalty and knew that I would never tolerate infidelity from her. About two and a half weeks ago, when I was away at a construction site, I got a call from one of my workers named Earl. He informed me that he was in the alley behind my house and noticed a luxury BMW parked nearby. Earl asked if I had bought a BMW, to which I flatly refused. I reminded him that I had always been a fan of pickups. Earl expressed his suspicions, wondering why Charlene invited a friend and forced him to park in the back. The situation seemed very dubious to him. In search of clarity, I asked Earl about the color of the car. He replied, She's red, Bubba. I vaguely remember the new lawyer leaving the party in a bright red car. Earl, I need you to park discreetly in a place where he won't detect your presence and make sure that no one leaves my residence and gets into this car. Please let me know as soon as you have gathered all the necessary information. Earl obediently followed my instructions, using binoculars to observe the back entrance to my house. 
About 45 minutes later, Earl contacted me. Bubba, I regret to inform you that a well-dressed young man came out the back door of your house. I noticed Charlene standing right in the doorway wearing a bathrobe even though it was noon. That vile woman. If she cheated with this insignificant fool, she will undoubtedly regret her birthday. He won't be of much value either when I'm done with him. You can't mess with Bubba. I returned home the next day and then went to a spy shop in the Midlands that was recommended to me. I needed concrete evidence before taking any action. I bought a spy camera for the bedroom, cleverly disguised as an alarm clock. Charlene probably wouldn't even notice her presence. It worked on the principle of motion detection. I also purchased software that allowed me to secretly listen in on her phone conversations. Whenever her phone rang or she made a call, I could discreetly eavesdrop on it on my device. I have no idea how this technology works, and I'm not particularly interested in it. I just want to keep up to date with her affairs. In addition, the camera automatically started recording when someone entered the room, providing me with evidence if they repeated their actions. When I got home in the evening, I wondered if Charlene would respond to my advances. Not that I wanted to repeat the meeting, but I was curious to observe her reaction. But she expressed fatigue and disinterest. I think I've found the answer. On Sunday evening I made it clear that I would be out of town again for a few days. Even though she looked disappointed, I felt that her reaction was insincere. The next morning, I kissed her goodbye and left. Almost immediately after I left, she contacted Howard, informed him of my absence and made an appointment for an afternoon meeting. They agreed to meet in the alley as before. Although it hurt, I had to let them act. I needed concrete evidence. Gradually I began to realize that my marriage was most likely over. True to my word, I went to my place of work, which was about a hundred miles away, and spent the night in a motel. That evening, I drowned my sorrows in alcohol and, trying to fall asleep, found myself overcome with tears. The next day, while Charlene was at work, I returned home. Impatiently waiting to see what my recording device captured, I anxiously scanned the recordings, hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. I transferred the recording to my laptop and watched with a heavy heart as Howard and Charlene engaged in intimate activities in our own bed. The quality of the video left no doubt, both of them were clearly identified in it. Although I never believed that Howard could surpass me, she seemed to find pleasure in his company. It became obvious that my marriage was coming to an end, but not without a desire for revenge. I overheard them talking while they were getting dressed. Charlene, you are incredibly skilled in bed. I wish my wife could satisfy me as much as you do. She doesn't even want to diversify our intimate life, Howard said. Charlene replied, Thank you, Howard. You're not so bad yourself. I gave you a great performance, baby. I bet it was much better than your hillbilly husband's. Charlene quickly intervened. Howard, never disrespect Bubba. I love Bubba with all my heart. He is an exceptional lover, an outstanding husband, a wonderful father, and brings me great happiness. Then why did you agree to let me into your bedroom? Asked Howard. Charlene confessed. Bubba and I have been together since we were 12 years old. We've been in an intimate relationship since I was 16, and I've never been with anyone but him. I guess I'm just curious, Howard. Your charm and Charlene's attentiveness intrigued me. I had such a desire and I wanted you to satisfy it. You have intelligence and sophistication that intrigued me, and I wanted to experience it for myself. Wow, you still find me attractive and attractive even though you're 12 years younger, she remarked. Well, Charlene, you're just a beauty. Age doesn't matter, he replied. But we need to be careful. If Bubba ever finds out about us, he'll kill us both. I think it's better to end everything right now, he added. Come on, Charlene. Just one more time. Let's do it when he's not home again, and then we'll never do it again, he pleaded. Unless, of course, you ask me to do it again, he grinned. Don't forget that I'm married too, and my wife will ruin me if she finds out. I do not know, Howard. I don't want to risk it for too long, she hesitated. 
but I think that the last farewell meeting will not be superfluous. Bubba will be leaving again at the end of this week, so let's make it unforgettable. With that, they left the room, and the camera was turned off. It was just a momentary desire that needed to be satisfied. There were no deep feelings or love in it. It was just the result of lust. It was high time they realized that joking with Bubba was a bad idea. I went back to the cafe and waited patiently for my friends to come. I needed their help in this matter, and I had an idea that amazed even myself. I dialed Earl's number and instructed him to get Leon and Tiny to meet me at the cafe. The three were prominent figures in the oil industry, especially Tiny, who was an impressive 6 feet 6 inches tall and weighed about 320 pounds. They were not only successful, but also incredibly loyal to me. When they finally arrived, I gathered them around me and explained the whole situation. They were completely shocked that Charlene could betray me like that. Naturally, they demanded to see the videos I mentioned, but I knew better. I could see right through their facade. They just wanted to see Charlene naked. Charlene made a serious mistake by contacting this fashionable lawyer, and she will regret it soon. I guess guys will always be guys. Having explained my plan to them, they left laughing, anticipating the fun that awaited us. That evening, I made a conscious effort to appear normal. I decided to approach Charlene, curiously watching her reaction. Like last time, she rejected my advances, saying she was not in the mood. Deep down, I suspected that she was afraid that I would notice something unusual. Anticipating the right moment, I informed her that I would have to leave again the next day. She reacted dispassionately, simply responding with an indifferent, Okay. The next day I went to the Midlands to meet with a lawyer I know. We started drafting divorce papers and preparing a lawsuit against Charlene's employer. I've arranged for his representative to be present the next day when we surprise Charlene and Howard. Everything had been carefully planned and I was looking forward to witnessing their inevitable last act of indiscretion. That evening, I was overcome with deep sadness. I reflected on the death of my marriage. Charlene, noticing my gloomy mood, asked if everything was all right. I brushed off her concern by saying I wasn't feeling well. Without further conversation, I turned away and pretended to be asleep. And so, going back to the beginning of the story, Everything was fine. Earl and Leon accompanied me in a truck equipped with rope and duct tape, ready for the upcoming events. Following my instructions, Tiny settled into a company truck with a trailer, accompanied by a massive forklift truck. Given his exceptional skills as a forklift operator, I had full confidence in his abilities. As I drove past the alley, my main goal was to make sure Howard was there. And indeed, there he is his BMW, discreetly parked at the back of my lot. I instructed Tiny to park along the alley and ordered him to bring the forklift to Howard's car. He had to carefully install the loader and wait for my signal. Meanwhile, I drove the truck up to the house, deciding not to park right in front of it. After getting out of the car, I joined Earl and Leon, each carrying sturdy chairs, rope, and duct tape. As soon as we reached the front door, I immediately contacted the baby, advising him to proceed with the task. While we were making our way into the house, Tiny skillfully used a loader to transport Howard's small BMW to the public pool, located at the end of the block. Fortunately, the pool had a gate wide enough for the loader to pass through. Using his bolt cutters, Tiny removed the barrier and plunged Howard's car into the water. At that time, the others went up the stairs and headed for my bedroom. As we approached the room, a noise reached our ears. Curiosity got the better of me, and I cautiously peeked through the slightly ajar door to see Charlene engaged in intimate activities with Howard. Realizing that we had stumbled upon this compromising situation, I signaled Earl and Leon to detain Howard first. Their task was to attach him to a chair and plug his mouth with duct tape. As soon as Howard was immobilized, we burst into the room, our voices filled with anger. Charlene's panicked scream filled the air as she said my name, doubting my presence. 
Desperately trying to explain herself, she begged for forgiveness, fearing my anger and possible harm to Howard. Following my instructions, they quickly tied up Howard so that he couldn't escape. Then they strapped Charlene to another chair without sealing her mouth. Realizing that they were staring at the naked body of my now separated wife, I chose to ignore the situation, knowing full well that our marriage was on the verge of disintegration. After transferring Howard to the back of my truck, they placed him in the trunk, firmly attaching the chair to the headache rack. I pulled up a chair, sitting directly in front of Charlene. Tears streamed down her face. She repeatedly expressed her remorse, apologizing for her stupid actions. Charlene, I said, my voice filled with a mixture of disappointment and confusion. I just need to understand why. Am I really not coping with the role of a husband? Am I not coping with the role of a lover? Why did you betray our trust and our family? I was choking through my tears. Bubba, I know it looks terrible, but please know that I still deeply love you. Howard was just a fleeting moment that meant nothing to me. I promise you, that was the last time we ever met. I was stupidly curious about what a man like him could offer in bed. He made me feel good for a moment but he doesn't look anywhere near the passionate and devoted lover you are. Maybe it was just a momentary blunder for you, Charlene. But you've caused me a lot of pain. We were building a life together, and you decided to destroy it for the sake of a temporary affair. She begged. No, Bubba. I beg you to find the strength in your heart to forgive me. I'm ready to do anything to make amends. It was an irrational wish that I foolishly fulfilled. I never wanted to hurt you. She apologized, her voice full of regret. Charlene, I've had my moments of temptation too, but I've never given in. I have always remained faithful to you and cherished you above all else. And yet you chose to have an affair with a younger and chattier lawyer right here in our own bed. I'm sorry, Charlene, but what you did is completely unacceptable. Earl and Leon waited outside the door while I watched Charlene's tears and desperate pleas. Despite her screams, I continued to tape her mouth shut. We carefully lowered her down and put her in the back of the truck with Howard. After attaching it to the headache rack, I looked at Howard and noticed the overwhelming fear on his tear-stained face. By addressing both of them, I made it clear that they were going to experience the same humiliation as me at this moment. Addressing Howard, I emphasized the consequences of entering into an intimate relationship with someone else's wife, and assured him that after today, he would never repeat such an act. I hung signs around their necks, one with the confession, I cheated on my wife, the other, I cheated on my husband. To increase the public shame, I decorated the truck with noticeable signs on both sides, on which was written in red paint, Adulterers. As we drove through the city center, I couldn't resist honking my horn, making it clear that we were here. When we arrived at the office of the law firm where Howard and Charlene worked, the audience was gripped by a whole range of emotions. Some were horrified, others were amused, and some showed obvious disgust. Having gathered my resolve, I honked until several people appeared, including the senior partner. After getting out of the truck, I approached him with a specific purpose. It seemed appropriate to enlighten him about the activities of his two employees during the lunch break. At the same time, a representative of the law firm I hired came up and handed my claim to the senior partner. Taking another step, he handed Charlene the divorce papers. Since she was shackled, I temporarily freed one of her hands so that she could accept the documents, and then fixed it again. I assured Charlene that I would keep the papers until we got to her parents' house, despite her futile attempts to persuade me to let her go. In response to this situation, the senior partner approached Howard and Charlene and angrily exclaimed, You're fired! With a mixture of satisfaction and anticipation, we set off for Howard's house. The expression on his face upon arrival was priceless. After getting out of the truck, I went to the door and told his wife about the whole incident, giving her a copy of the video. Two small children were standing behind her. 
I couldn't help but feel sorry for her, even though it was important for her to realize the true nature of her husband. Leon and Earl carefully took him out of the pickup and put him in the yard. With tears in her eyes, she walked up to him and slapped him hard in the face. After giving Charlene a disapproving look, she retreated into the house. Before entering the house, I informed her that, in my opinion, Howard's car had jumped out of gear in the alley behind my house and rolled into the swimming pool at the end of the block. Howard stayed there while we drove away. Charlene was still sitting in the back of the truck, and we drove off and headed for her parents' house. When we arrived at the door, I noticed that Monroe and Mildred were already standing there. I explained the whole situation to them and offered video evidence if they wanted it. I made it clear that I didn't play games and that it was all Charlene's fault. They looked at their daughter and shook their heads. Monroe spoke up, expressing his apologies. Bubba, we are very sorry that our daughter caused you so much trouble. You were a faithful husband to her and a wonderful son-in-law to us. Could you think about forgiving Charlene? I understand that she still has feelings for you. I'm sorry, Monroe, but I can't return her trust. I did everything I could as a husband, and that's how she betrays me. I saw her having an intimate relationship with Howard in our own bed on video, and then I caught them at the scene of the crime. No, I can't find the strength to forgive such actions. Mildred sympathized, saying that they understood my decision and it was understandable. I untied Charlene and let her go back to her parents. I took the tape off her mouth. She begged, Please, Bubba, I'm so sorry. I promise I will never do anything like this again. Now I understand how stupid it was and it was all in vain. He wasn't as satisfying a partner as you are. I'm ready for anything if you give me another chance. She was begging, standing naked with a charming look, begging me for forgiveness. I almost gave up, but then I remembered that Bubba is not to be trifled with. I'm sorry, Charlene, but I just can't. I'm leaving you with your parents. Please feel free to pick up your things from home tomorrow while I'm at work. We will discuss the details of our divorce soon, and I am ready to share everything fairly except for my business, which I will keep for myself. I ask you not to dispute anything, because I would not like the video to become popular. It is worth noting that Charlene is currently living with her parents, having agreed to the conditions specified in the divorce documents. As a result, I kept the house, and I understand that maybe it was cruel to her, but she made a serious mistake and faced the consequences. In the end, I decided to drop the lawsuit against her employer because I just didn't want to mess with it. First of all, I tried to convey my point of view, but over time I began to miss Charlene a lot. I managed to get away from anger and embarrassment. I did not seek a romantic relationship and was not interested in it. I occasionally had casual meetings during business trips out of town, but they didn't matter to me at all. Mildred suddenly contacted me and suggested that we meet for lunch to catch up and discuss something. Curiosity about Charlene's current situation made me agree. It's been quite a while since we last talked, and when we finally met again, I was overwhelmed by a mixture of emotions and thoughts. All she wanted to do was apologize. Mildred informed me that Charlene is still living with them. She got a new position with a couple of lawyers in a nearby town. The elderly gentleman needed a competent legal assistant. She found great satisfaction in her new job. Mildred mentioned that Charlene resolutely refused all potential suitors. Despite numerous offers, she kept hoping that one day I would think about making peace with me. I confessed to Mildred how much I miss Charlene and how I managed to forgive her. It took me a long time, but in the end I found understanding and acceptance in my heart. I went up to Mildred and said, Mildred, I want to clarify that I can't make any promises, but I think it's time to contact Charlene and maybe meet up for a drink or something. When I found out about their affair, I was filled with anger and resentment, and I never gave her a chance to explain herself. Bubba, it will be very important for you if you sit down with her and listen to what she has to say. She realizes the seriousness of her mistake and has already faced the consequences. Mildred nodded and replied, Okay, 
I think I'm finally ready to sit down and listen to her. Call her and we'll see how it goes. That afternoon, I picked up the phone and dialed Charlene's number. Let's set up a meeting tonight at our favorite local bar. Charlene was filled with anticipation. Shortly after, Mildred called me to express her gratitude and share Charlene's excitement about our long-awaited reunion. Arriving in advance, I ordered a beer and took a secluded table for both of us to ensure the privacy of our conversation. But when Charlene came in, I was stunned. She looked just awful. She gained a lot of weight and there were bruises under her eyes, as if she uses a lot of alcohol and sleeps little. I went to her, wanting to greet Charlene. Hello, Charlene. I said warmly, unable to hide my bewilderment. What's the matter with you? You look very tired. When tears welled up in her eyes, she whispered, I'm very glad to see you too, Bubba. I feel very bad without you. We exchanged pleasantries for a few minutes, until Charlene's voice interrupted the small talk. Bubba, I've devoted the last year to fighting depression, but it didn't work out for me. Bubba saves me. I can't live like this anymore. I couldn't understand what Charlene was trying to say, what had made her so desperate. Countless nights have passed in tears as I tried to comprehend the immense pain and shame I caused our family, not to mention the loss of the person I cherished the most. I have to admit, I've never really felt anything for Howard. However, he had a charm that beckoned me with the words I wanted to hear. I'm sure he manipulated me in a way that I'll never be able to understand. I was struggling with myself, but I was emotionally broken. I got involved with bad people. And now tears welled up in her eyes as she continued to speak. Pausing to take a handkerchief out of her purse, she continued, expressing her deep affection for me. First of all, she dreamed of rewinding time and was ready to sacrifice anything to make it possible. Bubba, I'm addicted to illegal drugs. I don't understand how I came to this. I need help. I hugged Charlene and promised that together with her parents, we would cope with this addiction. I took her home to her parents and discussed further actions with them. But from then on, I didn't want to see Charlene anymore. She is currently being treated at a clinic for addicts to illegal substances, which I pay for, and her parents are grateful to me. Silly Charlene turned her own life into complete chaos with her novel, and this is only her fault. Have you ever experienced a sudden feeling of anxiety? The kind that sends goosebumps down your spine and makes the hair on the back of your neck stand on end? Tonight was one of those nights for me. My name is Bill Jackson. This is a 46-year-old man who is 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighs 175 pounds. I hold the position of plant director at a well-known brewing company in Fort Worth, Texas. I want to clarify that I am not Peter Griffin from Family Guy. My wife Janice, or Jen as I affectionately call her, is also 46 years old, 5 feet 6 inches tall, and weighs 130 pounds. She has an attractive figure with graceful curves, especially noticeable in the dress she wore today. Jen works in the design and graphics department of a well-known advertising firm in Fort Worth. We have been happily married for 25 years, but our relationship goes back to the distant past. We grew up in the same neighborhood as kids and became inseparable friends in the fourth grade. We remained best friends throughout high school, and in high school we became a couple. Jen even accompanied me to the prom, an evening that strengthened our bond and made us even closer to each other. That night, Jen and I had a momentous moment. We lost our innocence with each other. We both studied at the University of Texas for three years, and for the last two years we lived together in a cozy two-room apartment. Our relationship was strong, and as a result, we had a beautiful daughter, Judy, who is now 21 and studying at the University of Oklahoma. Judy, being a witty person, jokingly calls her university a traitor. She found love in the arms of Brad Johnson, a charming young man from Oklahoma City. Brad, who comes from a family connected with the oil industry, brings stability and maturity to their relationship because he is already 26 years old. We can't help but be happy for them. He is currently pursuing a degree in business law, 
and Judy is studying various subjects, having not decided on a specialty. While studying at the university, she also combined her studies with work in a support group, while using my financial support. As for our financial situation, Jen receives a solid salary of $55,000 a year. On the other hand, my work brings in more than $300,000 a year, providing us with financial stability and security. About 15 years ago, we came across a house on Arlington Lake that had been confiscated. Without hesitation, we made a cash offer in the amount of Tricot, $50,000, and successfully purchased it. After the renovation, the cost of the house reached an impressive $2.5 million. But I want to distract myself for one evening, which sent chills down my spine, and I got lost in thought. Just three days ago, Jen informed me about her company's upcoming Saturday night party. She anticipated my disinterest and fatigue, assuring me that I didn't need to be present if I didn't want to. But contrary to her assumptions, I enthusiastically expressed a desire to attend. Despite Jen's repeated assurances that my presence was not mandatory, I insisted that I couldn't wait to meet her colleagues. Upon arriving at the event, my wife wore a stunning black dress that accentuated her long blonde hair and mesmerizing blue eyes. As we entered the main hall, I noticed a middle-aged man approaching Jen. Curiously, she held out her hand, inviting him to stop. There was a pause in this unexpected communication, after which she turned to me and kissed me gently on the cheek. That's how my anxious emotions began that evening. Jen and I had a few drinks. I intended to stay sober because I was in charge of driving and wanted to keep a clear awareness of the events that unfolded during the night. Until that moment, I had never suspected my wife of infidelity and did not believe that she was doing it that evening. But it was this man who instilled in me a sense of anxiety. Subsequently, I learned from one of the visitors to our table that his name was Jack Taylor. He was a well-known advertising sales representative in my wife's company. Jen and I continued to dance together several times. I noticed her stealing glances at Jack several times, and he returned her affection. When we finally stopped dancing, Jack approached Jen and asked her to dance, without even noticing my presence or asking my permission. His arrogance was infuriating. Jen, noticing my growing disappointment, politely declined his offer and stressed that all her dances were intended only for her husband. It was obvious that he was furious, as he ran off to dance with another woman. When Jen wanted another drink, I offered to bring her a drink from the bar. But on the way back I noticed Jack standing in front of Jen and engaging in conversation with her. I noticed the sadness in her eyes as she shook her head in denial. Trying to decipher her words, I skillfully read her lips as she muttered, I'm sorry baby. Given the deafening noise in our workplace, I've become quite adept at lip reading. This short conversation cast a shadow over the rest of the evening, forcing me to be vigilant and refrain from further drinking. I longed to maintain complete control over my feelings. Watching those around me closely, I couldn't help but notice that everyone seemed to be watching me, Jen, and even Jack. It became clear to me that something was wrong, but I did not know what the nature and duration of this mysterious case was. The inability to contain my emotions prompted me to talk to Jen on the way home. I asked her directly about Jack, questioning the nature of their relationship, and expressing concerns about infidelity. Jen quickly assured me that Jack was just a work colleague, and expressed disbelief that I had ever doubted her loyalty. She confessed her unwavering love for me, and that evening I had no more words left. Jen and I understood each other deeply. She knew that if I ever discovered her cheating, it would have serious consequences. Throughout our upbringing, she witnessed my penchant for revenge and was always by my side, supporting me when necessary. One case in high school was an example of such devotion. When a guy taunted me, I found him after school and taught him a lesson, taking off his pants at the same time. While studying at the University of Texas, there was another incident when a football player tried to force Jen to kiss him. Without hesitation, I quickly took action and injured his knee, which caused him to miss several games. 
The coaches wanted to take action against me but Jen intervened, threatening to go to the police and press charges of attempted harassment. The coaches quickly retreated. So it should have been clear to Jen that I would not tolerate betrayal, or so one might think. Given Jen's impressive salary of over 50000 my own solid income of over 300000 as well as her savings in 401k of over 155000 and my own million in a similar account, I felt obliged to make sure of her loyalty. I enlisted the services of a private investigator who had previously helped us with workers' compensation cases at my brewery. In short, I requested audio, video, and photo evidence. And so a few weeks later, over a cup of coffee at the table in our dining room, I decided to talk to Jen. Jen, will you ever cheat on me? Have you ever cheated on me before? I asked. Jen replied, No, honey, I would never do that. Why are you even asking? With a heavy heart, I took out a large envelope and began to put the photos on the table one by one. In this photo, you're kissing Jack outside a motel. Here you walk through the door with him, and in this photo, his car is parked in front of our house. In addition, in this photo, you are engaged in intimate activities with him while he is sitting in my chair. And finally, in this photo, he is having sexual intercourse with you in our own bed. Jen begged, Bill, it doesn't mean anything, I don't like him, it's a purely physical feeling. Overwhelmed with emotion, I asked, Is he better than me, Jen? Is he better off? I continued, How long has this been happening and why? Jen reassured me, No, he's no bigger and certainly no better than you, Bill. As for why this happened, I can't give a clear answer. It's just different, that's all. And we've been doing this for over a year now. Have you had a lover for over a year? Bill, at work we don't call it a lover. I'm his office wife. A few people at work do that. What? You won't leave me, Bill? No way. It's not me who's leaving, it's you. I packed almost all your clothes and personal belongings in your BMW. I want you out of my house right now, you wanton wench. I grabbed Jen's hand and walked her to the car. Where am I going, Bill? I don't care where you go. Go to your office, husband. I can't go to him. Jack is married and has three children. I already knew about it. It was in the private investigator's report, the name of his wife and children, as well as the address. But I did not tell Jen that I had this information. Jen, I don't care where you go. Go back to the motel and don't forget to tell your lover friend about it. But get out of here and stay away. Bill, are you going to throw away 25 years of a good marriage? Jen, it was less than 24 years of a good marriage. Within a year, our marriage was ruined by infidelity, and unfortunately, it was I who decided to put an end to it, while calling Jen a whore. Confused, Jen drove off in her car. Three hours later, the phone rang. It was my beloved daughter Judy who talked about the wedding plans. Despite the fact that Jen and I were preparing together, I was the one who took care of the expenses for what was supposed to be a grand celebration. After exchanging pleasantries, the conversation went awry. Judy misled me by saying that Jen told her that I kicked her out of the house. She couldn't understand why I did that. Trying to be honest with my daughter, I told her that I had caught Jen cheating. But Judy waved me off, saying that this is a common phenomenon in the 21st century and it's okay for a woman to seek her own pleasure. I even asked if she had done the same with Brad, her partner, implying to which she said it was none of my business since they were not married. Disappointed, I asked if anyone else I knew was doing this, to which she called Betty. Despite her indifferent attitude, I couldn't help but feel betrayed by my own family, the three of us who should have been united. I'm asking you to let my mom come home. It is very important. Dad, I had the pleasure of meeting Jack, and he's a really wonderful person. Mom wants him to play a role in the wedding, and I feel the same way. I was shocked by what I heard. Are these people not smart enough? Have they drugged their minds with drugs or something? Well, Judy, if you want him to be at your wedding, let him walk you down the aisle because I won't be there if he's there. After that, I abruptly ended the conversation. My phone rang several times during the night but I decided not to answer. 
two days later. Jen arrived at the house with a court order giving her temporary permission to enter until their problems were resolved. She wanted to discuss her affair, believing that it had no effect on their marriage. Despite my requests, she continued to show sympathy for me and saw no reason to break off her relationship with Jack. But I made it clear to her that I would never tolerate cheating on my wife. As for her desire for affection, I vowed never to touch her again. She could have occupied the master bedroom where she cheated on him. Since I found out about her infidelity, I've been sleeping in one of the spare rooms. Jen denied that she was a libertine, but I no longer cared about her words. I intended to file for divorce soon and rid myself of her shameful presence. She opposed the divorce, mentioning that Jack and she had consulted with his lawyer. According to their plan, if I divorce her, she will get the house and half of our property, since I earn more than she does. I will receive a significant portion of your income as alimony. So, my dear husband, you can relax and enjoy the situation, as Jack would say. I am deeply disappointed with you and Jack. You are the wrong person. I went into my bedroom and closed the door. Around midnight, a tearful Jen knocked on my door, apologizing and expressing her wish that everything would get better. But at the same time, she wanted to continue her relationship with Jack. The next morning I turned to one of our company's lawyers for advice. He confirmed that Jen's claims were accurate. She'll get the house and half of our assets. Fortunately, Judy was no longer living with us, so child support would not be required. Yes, she will receive at least $125,000 in annual alimony, Bill said, expressing his sympathy for my deplorable situation. Over the next few days, the atmosphere became increasingly calm as we avoided communicating with each other. But on the third day, Jen came out to meet me, asking if I was foolishly going to seek a divorce. She confidently stated that her lawyer is now studying this issue. Angered by her words, I replied, Go to hell, Jen. I'll take everything that belongs to you. Without saying another word, I drowned my grief in a bottle of High Life beer. About an hour later, Jen ended the phone conversation in the dining room and handed me the phone. Someone needs to talk to you, Bill. Hi, Bill. This is Jack speaking. Hey, buddy. I understand that you're upset, but it's important for you to cooperate, my friend. If you don't agree, we will make your life miserable and take everything from you. You don't know who you're dealing with. You can take the one you contacted. I don't need her anymore. She's not worth it. So go and do whatever you want with her and yourself. Then I angrily ended the conversation. I looked at Jen and couldn't believe how stupid they both were. I caught them in the act by hiring a private investigator. I had video and audio evidence. I also had photos. If they were as smart as they thought they were, wouldn't they realize that conversations in this house and on this phone are still being recorded? They were naive. The following week, Jen met with her office colleague four times, but it was at the motel, not here. I warned her that if she ever brought him here again, I would harm both of them. I think she finally understood the seriousness of my threat. The brewery I worked at was acquired last year by a larger brewery from Colorado, more precisely, from the Rocky Mountains. We managed both products from a factory in Fort Worth, with me managing one and James managing the other. James, a younger and smarter man, served as the plant manager from Colorado. I appreciated him very much, especially since he, like me, understood the difficulties associated with divorce. Our company was interested in downsizing and having only one manager. Fortunately, our union has provided some leverage. They preferred the younger James, who was associated with the buying company. Attempts were made to buy me out, and the last offer was $500,000 with the option to convert my previous pension into company shares. In this bleak world, what stocks could be better than beer stocks? The idea was, to put it mildly, funny. One day, James and I visited a local strip club near the factory. Given his divorced state and lack of evening entertainment, he often visited this place. It was during this hike that it dawned on me when I came across our conversation. Suddenly, my life changed for the better. Bill... 
I understand what you're going through. My ex-wife has exhausted me financially. Recently, I sold all my property or gave it away, and then I just ran away without getting a divorce. James, my dear friend, you really are the smartest person I've ever known. I quickly finished my beer and shook his hand firmly, expressing my gratitude. Thank you, my friend. After that, I left the room and headed home. Fortunately, Jen wasn't there. Perhaps she was indulging in her late-night office chores. Jen didn't come home all night and I realized how little I missed her. There was a time when I loved Jen more than anything in the world, but now I despised her. My plan was going to come true very soon because today was Sunday. I was sitting at home, engrossed in a football match, when my daughter called me. Dad, have you calmed down after your anger? What is it? She asked. Slightly annoyed, I replied. What do you need, Judy? She explained that Mom wanted her to discuss wedding plans with me. Curious, I asked. Okay, what's on your mind, daughter? Judy and Mom think that Jack should also play a role at the wedding. They suggested that he follow you and me down the aisle and then take a seat next to Mom. I couldn't help but doubt her motives. Judy, do you really want this? She assured me, Yes, Daddy, I sincerely think this is a good idea. Jack is Mom's work partner, so we think he should participate in the wedding. I have a better offer. Have your father walk you down the aisle from the office as I won't be able to attend. I'll call Brad and apologize to him. Dad, please don't worry. Brad doesn't approve of this situation either. But on his wedding night, he'll put up with it. Judy, I wish you a happy life, darling. Goodbye. What did you mean by that, Dad? I didn't answer anything, just hung up the phone and started crying. Jen returned home on Sunday evening and asked, Did you miss me, honey? I will never miss you. You want in person. Just go somewhere and disappear. Jen ran to her room and cried. I was at the corporate office at 8 in the morning. I agreed to the ransom. I received half a million dollars which I transferred to an offshore account, in addition to my salary. Our house and cars had already been paid for, so the next step was the bank. I have prepared the documents to take out a loan using our house and Jen's BMW as collateral. The house was valued at two and a half million, so I easily took two million. Jen's car cost 45,000, and I easily got 35,000. My intention was to load her with debts, but I needed her to sign the papers. The hardest part was yet to come. I returned to my job knowing that I needed to complete the next two weeks to ensure a smooth transition. But working alongside James made her more tolerant. He really was an incredible person. Later in the afternoon, I called the wedding planner and informed her that I had canceled my card to prevent any future payments. I also made it clear that I would no longer be responsible for covering the costs of the wedding. So who's going to be responsible for the expenses, Mr. Jackson? She asked. Tell Judy to ask her new father, Jack, for money, I replied. Back at the office, I prepared several fabricated applications for an insurance policy, totaling a million dollars to insure my life. In the evening, I decided to contact Jen and surprise her with my call. Jen, if you're not going to be with Jack tonight, would you like to have dinner together? I asked. She seemed genuinely delighted at the invitation and exclaimed, That would be wonderful. I'm so glad you decided to forget about all this. Where would you like to go? To the Italian hotel in the city center, somewhere with beautiful lights. Is that okay with you? I replied. That sounds incredibly romantic, my dear. Maybe you'll get lucky tonight, Bill. I couldn't resist replying with a playful hint. I hope I have more luck than just luck today, Jen. Jen tried to kiss me, but I politely declined, offering to do it later. I cunningly fabricated a story about an insurance policy worth a million dollars. I deceived her by saying that the company insisted that I take out a policy and list her as a beneficiary. Coincidentally, Jen's sister, Betty, turned out to be a notary public. Realizing the need to sign documents with a notary, we decided to go to her house that evening. It was planned to sign the papers and then celebrate good luck. After paying for dinner, we went to her sister's, 
where Jen eagerly signed and initialed each page. Her delight at being together was palpable. In a state of intoxication from drinking six glasses of wine, she did not pay attention to what she was signing. As already mentioned, I was struck by her carelessness. The next day, I hurried to take the documents to both the mortgage company and the bank. The bank quickly gave me a loan of $35,000, instantly satisfying my immediate financial needs. But it will take at least a week to get the remaining $2 million. To secure my funds, I arranged for the transfer of money to an offshore account. A week later, after finishing my job at the brewery, I quickly stopped by the Ford dealership. There I exchanged my truck for a brand new Ford F350 truck, which I purchased for cash. My final destination was the bank where I intended to make a deposit. I closed all our credit cards, withdrew all our savings, and left only a thousand dollars in my checking account. In addition, I asked a friend to help me transfer my offshore money to other accounts to erase all traces and records. The next steps were more difficult for me because I didn't want innocent people to get hurt. I met with my future son-in-law and explained the situation to him, telling him that I had stopped financial support and expressed my concerns about my daughter's intentions towards him. I also shared audio recordings of my conversations with Judy, which left Brad devastated. My next destination was the house of a man named Jack Taylor. When the door was opened by a beautiful woman about 50 years old, I couldn't help but wonder how someone could betray such a stylish lady. As I said before, some people are just stupid. I gave Miss Taylor the videos, photographs, and audio evidence. She burst into tears, but before I left, she told me that this was not the first act of his infidelity, but he would definitely be the last with her. It turned out that she is one of the main shareholders of the Beckham Advertising Agency. I hope this revelation will not negatively affect the work of several of my acquaintances. Jen's financial situation seems to be quite difficult. She has to pay $700 a month for a car and an incredible $12,000 for a mortgage. It is difficult to imagine how she will manage to cope with these obligations. She may be counting on her officer husband's help in making these payments, but that remains unclear. Meanwhile, I'm heading to the dealership to pick up my 36-foot trailer. My plan is going smoothly so far, as I paid for the truck and van in cash and registered them in my cousin's name. Besides, I only have three credit cards, all in his name. I intend to go to Florida for a few years, where I hope to lay low and perhaps benefit from the fact that my wife will file for divorce because of the rejection of the child. This would be ideal, given the no competition clause in my contract that prevents me from working at another brewery for a year. It just so happened that the most famous brewery in the industry was located near the place of my planned stay on the RV in Florida. A year and three months have passed, and my circumstances have changed radically. Jack, as he expected, is now divorced, and has discovered that a woman really gets everything. As a result, his wife received the house and a significant 60% of their property, not to mention the annual alimony in the amount of $60,000. Jack found himself unemployed, but he managed to get a job at one of the few remaining blockbuster video stores. His job was to rewind cassettes and clean DVDs. To make ends meet, he rented a small studio apartment above an adult store. Jen, on the other hand, faced financial difficulties as she struggled to make payments for her house and car. She didn't know that I was secretly taking on these expenses and assumed that we always paid in cash. Unfortunately, in the end, due to financial difficulties, she lost both her house and her car. With a bad credit history, it is now difficult for her to find a decent apartment. To make ends meet, Jen works as a waitress at Denny's restaurant on the highway. In order to receive social assistance, she filed for divorce, claiming that she was abandoned. But she was disappointed to find that she didn't get anything from me as she expected. It turned out that they couldn't find me, and she had to speed up the divorce process in order to receive social security benefits. At the same time, my daughter, whom Jen expected to marry, decided not to marry. Brad, her fiancé, told Jen about some incriminating audio recordings, 
and she calmly admitted that having affairs on the side is not so bad if it suits the wife. It was the same excuse she had given me in the past. As a result, Brad cancelled the wedding. After the heartbreaking loss of her father, she lives in a modest two-room apartment located in a not very good neighborhood. Her sympathetic mother is her neighbor and a source of support. Unfortunately, I have heard rumors that my wife and daughter are in a relationship, although I hesitate to call them that because of the constant stream of different men who visit their apartment at night, exchanging money as if it were a deal. Meanwhile, life in South Florida was an absolute pleasure for me. An abundance of bikinis, a pleasant climate, and an amazing job next to the esteemed Bruce.